Um, okay, um, I'm going to get started for today here. So um, I had basically been planning on seeing if anybody had questions about assignment four here, which is um, that you had to write a couple of functions using recursion. So I'm basically going to kind of be going over assignment four here today, I believe. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, but yeah, if anybody joins and has questions specifically, um, I'll probably stop and um, um, work with them um, and, and, and answer their, any questions people have in general. Um, before I jump on to assignment four, um, I thought I'd say a little bit more about um, the recursion uh, lecture videos that we had this week. Uh, so for assignment four, you have to write um, just two recursive functions. So you're actually writing four regular functions this week. Uh, two of them should be non-recursive and then two of them should be recursive. Uh, I wanted to kind of step through this. So another good way to understand what recursion does is to actually use a debugger and step through things. Uh, I want to make a couple of notes though. So it turns out I didn't really have the example set up so you can run these programs using uh, the debugger. So, uh, let me just show real quickly and, and get this kind of down on video. If, if anybody's interested in, in recreating this or being able to run these uh, with the debugger, there's uh, like two steps you have to do. So first of all, um, in the examples um, project, um, uh, the, the examples folder here, there's a make file. Um, and uh, the, the way that I'd given it to people, um, I wasn't actually compiling with um, debug information compiled into the programs, okay? So you need to use this dash G flag in order to compile with debug information or else you can't really run the debugger well uh, with, with these compiled programs, okay? So uh, maybe I should add that in and actually uh, push that change to the repository. But, but that's one thing you'll have to do. If you do that, um, you should see if you, if you do like a, a, a rebuild here, let me close this up over here. Um, the effect when I rebuild it, I mean, you know, it should look carefully, but you'll see that I mean, basically that's the command that's being run on all of these programs here. In particular, you should see um, that we're using the dash G flag, which means these will all get compiled with debug information, including the one I want to run here, the 04 dash recursion. <coughs> but the other thing is that the default uh, debug task um, is set up to, to run uh, an executable called debug. And, and yeah, if you open up your debugger and look in there, you won't have this, you only have the GDB launch. Um, so what you kind of have to do, um, and, and I'm not, so there, there might be, I thought there'd probably be some way to just run an ad hoc debug session, which is what I'm trying to do, but apparently there's not in Visual Studio Code, so you really have to add a new debug configuration. So th this is what I did to get this debug configuration added. Um, you know, um, opened up the, the debug um, um, run and debug um, section here um, and then th this is where you select different things to launch and, and, and launch debug sessions with. Uh, in particular you can pull that down and you can do the add configuration. When you do that it adds like a new configuration uh, just added a um, third one for me here. Oh no it didn't. So uh, it should add a whole new block for you though I believe. Let me try that again. I thought it would um, Oh, I'll show. Um, so let me just show this from the beginning, okay? So um, you won't quite see this because I already have the configuration. So let me remove that to see if I can recreate the thing. So uh, and let me save this configuration and then let's try that again, okay? So when you do it, and when you say add configuration, you should see that there's an existing configuration. So what you want to do is you want to uh, select that we're going to do a C++ um, um, launch and attach, no, launch. So you want to launch it. What that means is, is it's going to run the new program and, and launch it in with the debugger. The GDB is the GNU debugger here. So if you select that, it'll give you basically a, a second blank configuration. And then you really just have to kind of um, 
change a few of these things to copy. So this configuration here should do a launch for the debug executable in each one of your assignment one, two, three, four, whichever is your current um, directory that you're in. So that's kind of how that file direct name here, that depends on what file that you have open and the directory that it's in, uh, it'll take that as the place to launch from. So uh, you can do the same thing if, if we launch the debugger when we have like one of these example programs open. But you know, it, we don't build executables called debug. Uh, we build executables like W04-1, W05-1, you know, by, by the name of the week. So um, you know, you should, I think you need to give it a different name or else things might get confused. So, so I'll call it like ad hoc week 04-1 um, debug session like that, okay? Um, so, and then here, uh, it, it, uh, you actually have to enter in the program to run here. Um, so this is really, uh, this is, it isn't going to prompt you for it. Um, maybe there's a way to do that, to have, to have it actually prompt you for the program you want to run in debug mode. But, um, but what this is saying is you really need to replace that. So in our case, it should be basically the same as this. Um, so use that directory file, may, file um, dir name or directory name slash and then we zero four dash one instead of debug okay <coughs> so i'm hard coding this debug task to actually look for an executable called w04-1 okay um, and you do also if you want it to work in my visual studio code setup that i have for you you also have to change the current working directory to to likewise be the, the same as with the file um, is in that you have open, right? I think that's it. So uh, just change those things, change, give it a slightly different name so you can see which one is which from this launch menu here. And then you have to correctly change the program that you want to run the debug session on. You have to change the current working directory and everything else should work as given, I believe. So then save that. Um, and apparently it updates immediately on save here, which is nice, okay? So what you should see then is that you'll now have the launch that I originally had, which tries to launch an executable called debug. And now we've got this new one that should try to launch the executable W04-1, which is the one I wanted to show you. Okay. So that should be it. You know, so make certain that you're you're compiling with the debug with debug flag turned on uh, in your make file. Um, and then once you've done that, we should be able to run a debug session. Okay. So I want to do that because I want to talk about um, recursion real quickly. I'm going to first go to um, the uh, power function that um, we had talked about in our video lectures for this week here. So let's, let's look at our base case here, um, raising something to a power of zero. That was one of the two base cases, okay? So hopefully everybody understands the base case. If you, if you hit a base case, it's relatively simple. So let's, um, let's see if I did that right here. So let's launch uh, in the debug mode. So, oh, I did miss one thing. Um, right now, um, So let me go back to that. So another good thing to do on that, um, so you can do add configuration, but just uh, ignore that so it won't add a new one. Uh, but another good thing to do is um, to, to turn on the stop and entry so it'll always um, be as if there's a breakpoint on the very first line of code in your um, program when you try and debug it. So let me turn that on as well here. So I'm going to make certain this rebuilds. I'm gonna make a small change, save that, control shift B to build, make certain it rebuilds. And then let's try launching that one more time. So launch. Uh, oh, uh, oh, um, so uh, yeah, I'm not quite doing that right. So this just selects which one you want to launch, but yeah, to actually launch it, then you either use like the F5 key or yeah, you can you can do the start debug command. So that was what I was doing wrong there. So so this, if you're kind of doing this by hand instead of using like keyboard shortcuts, um, is um, 
um, we need to do that to actually launch. Or maybe we can launch more here too. So that should launch our debug session. So now we're actually running our debug section. So we've got our local variables here, our watch points, and our call stack, um, and our output on our terminal here. Right, and since I set that flag, it actually stopped as if there's a breakpoint at the first very first line of code. Okay, so I've got I've got a breakpoint here. So let's continue. So it goes down here, so we can step in to that function and 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 watch it for our base case here, the base case when we try to raise to a power of zero. Right, so if you hit continue, it'll just keep running until it hits another breakpoint, which should be here. Um, and then let's step in. So notice that um, X is five and Y is zero. Right? Um, so you need to do this, the correct one. We want to step into this function to see what happens. When you first step in here, until you do one step, you can't actually see your variables. So, um, so let's, uh, let's just do step over from now on. And now at this point you can correctly see that our x and y parameters are five and zero right and notice uh, i want to point your attention to the call stack here so i'm gonna <coughs> excuse me i'm gonna come back to that but in this case since we're gonna hit uh one of our base cases um i mean it's relatively simple so since y is zero you know, this, this is going to be true. When we test Y zero, it's just going to immediately return one because anything raised to the power of zero should have a result of one, right? So if we step, we'll see that it jumps right to that return right away. Um, and um, if we step to get it actually is returning. So it went to the end of the power function. One more should give me back to main. So now we popped out of the power function and we're at this point afterwards. And, and then we should see that the result is one when we raised it to zero. Okay. Um, and uh, I mean, we, we could step into the next one. So we also, uh, as we talked about in the lecture this week, we did um, one as kind of also a base case. So something raised to the power of one should just be itself. So that's kind of another um, base case. But uh, so we could step in here. So let's step in step over so y is not zero it's actually one as you can see looking at the um the local variables here so um um so it'll you know so it's not true that y is zero but um it is true that y is one so it should just return x as the result right so return x and then we get the result of five raised to the power of one is five. All right. So let me step over. So this is another one raising the power of one, but so that should just be also 123.123. All right. Uh, here's five squared. I'm going to skip over that. Let's go down to the one where we do something to the 10th power because there's one thing that I, I wanted to talk about, make sure everybody understands here. So here we're going to raise two to the power of 10. Okay. So, so because I wanted to show more about how uh, recursion works using what's called the function stack. So over here, I pointed out once or twice, you know, this is what's called the call stack, um, also known as the function call stack, right? So the way that recursion works is by relying on this implicit function call stack that's, that's managed by the operating system when it's running programs that you ask it to run for you, okay? So let's step over. And then let's step into that, all right? So again, we, we, we've stepped in. We're actually in the power function at the start here. At this point, um, uh, this is also known as a stack frame. Um, at this point in our call to the, the function, um, x is 2. That's, that's what we're trying to, the, the base that we're trying to raise to. And then y is 10, okay? So that doesn't hit either of our base cases. That's going to hit this. Uh, general case, right? Because y is greater than one, it's, it's 10 right now. So it's going to call power again. So um, we could step into that, right? Um, so if I step into there, so notice, um, oh, um, oh, I messed that up. I, I, I stepped over again. So let me, let me go ahead and continue and restart that. Sorry about that. So I'll have to, I'll have to uh, restart, Let's set my breakpoint so I can go right to calling 10 to the power of two here, like that. Um, and let's start our debug session again. 
So we're at the start of the main function. If we continue on from here, we're about ready to call power to raise two to the power of 10. So let's step uh, uh, into that. So now we're kind of back to where I was almost. Um, so we're in our first call to power two where y is 10. So, so I don't mess that up again. I'm gonna put another breakpoint here so we always stop in power. So if I want to, I could continue on or I could step in. If I continue on, I mean, either, either way, it's gonna be calling power here. So let's, let's go ahead and step in, okay? So at this point, it's gonna call power, but subtract one from y, right? So, so what I meant to do last time was we step in, we're back into power here, okay? So again, notice the call stack. And, and you can actually click through these to get to the different parts of your call stack. So this was our first call to the function call stack when y was 10. We're now uh, to the second call to the power function on, on our function call stack, but y is nine, okay? Um, and you know, so this is a stack and we're gonna be, one of the purposes of this class on data structures is to talk about stacks. So, uh, but, but this is a very good kind of general concept to understand, so all, function calls and procedure calls are handled in an operating system by implementing them using a function call stack like this, okay? So what's really happening when you declare parameters like X and Y or local variables um, in a function like X and Y is, um, is that um, it actually places, it actually allocates memory on the function call stack for those local variables or parameters, all right? So, um, and, and every time it, it calls a new function, it pushes what's known as a stack frame um, onto your function call stack, okay? So um, I have a little thing, to, a little experiment to try here. Um, let me draw that up. I'm gonna be using my uh, web camera as a document camera here. So I just got it pointed down on my desk. Um, in fact, let's stop sharing. Um, so I think that uh, I'm gonna have to check out the effect of this. I'm not certain if this is gonna work very well or not, but um, I think that um, um, by stopping sharing, um, this should show up as kind of full screen on the video I record for YouTube for our help sessions here. So, so right now, I mean, you can think of the function call stack as just um, an area in memory, right? And um, I'm gonna probably draw it in the, um, opposite order of, of what you normally do. So, so let's, so your function call stack might be somewhere in memory. I just give it an arbitrary address like 5,000. Okay. And when you first start your main function, um, the, it, it, it pushes on um, a call stack for main and all your local variables on your main function will be in there. I won't draw those out, but when main called power for the first time, it pushes on another so I'm pushing kind of down on the stack here. So stacks are like a stack of plates. So it pushes on a call to power. And what, what happens then is, is you get allocated, in this case, power has two parameters, um, X and Y. And, and the first time we called it, we were trying to raise two to the power of 10. So X would have a value of 10. But, but anyway, I mean, you should think of this, again, as somewhere out in memory, um, the, as part of our call stack, we've allocated some memory uh, so that locally, when I'm inside of my power function here, if you can read that, I'm not, I'm not very good uh, handwriting all either. I should work on my handwriting. But when you call that, um, um, it actually allocates some memory to hold the local variables and the local parameters, X and Y, okay? And so that means if I change the values of these, it's, it's changing these. And, and this is necessary explicitly, you know, this, this call stack is, is necessary explicitly because we want to support recursion, okay? So since this is a recursive function, I can't just have one global location allocated for Y because when I call power um, the second time, a new stack frame is gonna be added, but it has its own memory allocated for X and Y for my stack. And in this case, X is always two, but Y came down to nine because we're raising, um, because we're trying to calculate two to the raise to the power of nine to return that and then multiply it by two one more time to get our final result. That's how this recursive um, version of power works, right? And I should have mentioned, this is a, a tail recursive function. Um, so so it's, it's relatively easy to visualize, all right? Um, so, 
and you know, since since y is nine, we're still not to the base case of zero or one. So you know, it, it's gonna again come down there and call power recursively, which will put another um, frame on the call stack, um, and this time allocating some room on the function call stack for x. And, and y will be eight this time. And it's gonna keep doing that, okay? So uh, I'm gonna switch back, but it, that's, oh, and, and then what happens though, so when we return, basically, uh, so what I, um, one thing I didn't um, quite put on here, but when we return a value from a function, basically what it does is it, it, it puts the return value onto the stack so that on returning back, um, the, the that, I mean, that's part of the, um, I guess that's part of the function call frame of the caller. Okay, so when you return a value back, there was some, some space set aside to hold that return value so that you could then use that inside your function. So, so eight, when we call two to the power of eight, it's gonna call itself recursively, but when it returns, it's gonna uh, return what, you know, if, it, if it's implemented correctly, what two to the eight is so far, which is, um, um, uh, 256, right? To the eight is 256, two to the nine is 512, and two to the 10 is 1024, right? So it ends up returning like 256. And I'll just kind of put it there, a little bit probably tough to see, but uh, so, so basically when, when it pops off the, the, the call frame for this function call, you know, we, 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 we would change our stack pointer to be back to here, so this becomes the new top of the frame when we hit return, um, and we'll have our return value, 256 in this case, kind of there um, at the top of our frame so that we can use with the current function call, all right? So let me, let me go back to um, um, our code here. So, um, all right, so we're we're at that point right now. We, we've got um, um, we've called power twice. Um, the first time we call it with y of ten, um, and then it recursively called itself, passed it in y minus one, so y was nine. Um, and I'm just going to keep hitting continue here. You'll see it. So I'll keep breaking because I'm going to just keep running down here, calling power recursively, and I'll come back in. Um, so if you, if you, if I keep hitting continue. Um, and I'll be here um, where I've got a new call on my call stack with um, uh, y is eight, um, and then seven, six, five, four, three, two. So at this point, you know, I'm, I'm like, what, 10 calls deep or nine calls deep onto my stack. So the, again, these represent pushing um, uh, frames, call frames onto my function call stack here. So, and in my current frame, I'm trying to solve the, the problem of two raised to the power of two. Um, you know, we still haven't hit the base case yet. So this is gonna call one more time. It's gonna call it recursively and subtract one from y. So, so, um, so if we continue on, uh, we're at our final call, but now this is how recursion ends then. So now we're finally gonna hit our base case because y was, uh, was one. So we're just gonna return two as the result. This will cause um, this frame to be popped off of the stack and it's gonna return two as the result. So there'll be a value of two at the top of my function call stack, which can be used. And so now if I um, step through this, we'll be returning and it's gonna be a little bit hard to see because I've got so many function calls on my stack frame that they've gone off the end here. But now we've got, you know, this was 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So as soon as I return um, from here, if we continue stepping on, um, now we've actually returned back. So now we're at the, we're now at, at our call frame where y was 2. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2 for y. We successfully called for when y was 1 and, and returned the value of 2. Right? And now we've got that. So we're going to multiply 2 by 2. So, so return 2. And again, we're holding the return value from our power function at the top of the call stack. We can multiply it by the, the value of x, which is 4, and we're going to return that. Right? So now all we're going to be doing is we're going to keep popping these off um, the stack in order to 
multiply the correct number of times, you know, x uh, 10 times to get 2 to the power of 10. All right. So if, if you watch my call stack, it's just going to, you know, we're popping things off. So the call stack is going to get smaller and smaller as we return, as, as we multiply, get the value that was returned from our recursive call, multiply it by x, and then return that. Um, and then, you know, so we get down here at the end that we end up with our result of 124, which, which is what we're expecting as the correct result here, okay? Um, so yeah, I mean, that was real quick, uh, the, the, uh, of, um, uh, recursion, but it is, I mean, it is, um, good to understand what's going on here. So, so the way recursion works is that there's a stack that's maintained by the operating system really is the thing. Um, it's, 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 it's a combination of the operating system and the computer architecture. So even down at the hardware level, there's some support for these function call stacks uh, to be implemented. But, but you need that because if you, need, if, if you want to support the ability to write recursive functions in a high level programming language like C++ and C, you have to support a function call stack because you can't have just one global, you know, if I declare a function like power, I can't have just one thing of X because I could call power many times. Um, so, so I have to have a way of if, if I call something raised to the thousandth power that I can have potentially thousands of stack frames where I keep track of the, the individual different X's and Y's for each of the thousand deep recursion that I'm doing there. Okay. Um, let me just real quick, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I, I want to, you know, the recursion isn't always um, as straightforward as that. So I mentioned briefly tail recursion. So basically there's only one recursive call and it, and it, if we call it recursively, it happens as the very last thing before we return. So that's known as tail recursion. Okay? And actually some compilers can, can, can spot that and optimize it away. So it return, it would turn your tail recursion into an actual iterative function. And if you tried and step through it, um, you wouldn't see the call stack. And, and in fact, if we compile it without the um, the debug flag and we turn on optimization, it might very well do that. The the GNU compiler is, um, I mean, that's one of the kinds of things that it does when it, when it when you compile with optimization and setting on like detect tail recursion and turn that into um, um, iteration because iteration tends to be less expensive, you know, so, so better performance than, than, all, than doing all these recursive function calls. Okay. Um, so let's just look at, um, there was one other example of recursion here to find the maximum. Um, I put this in here because actually next week you're going to, um, be writing functions, not, so not this assignment, but assignment five, that are similar to the um, largest recursive that we do here. So here, the basic idea is um, we pass an array, I'm only gonna show one example here. So we've got an array of five values, um, if we look at the values here, three, eight, two, nine, seven, and, and, and the function, you know, we just wanna find the largest. So if, um, and, and the way this function is written though, both iterative and recursive versions, you can just ask for the largest in a subportion of the array. So when you get B and E, you're supposed to be passing the begin and end index of the of the locations in the array that you want to search for the largest and find the largest of, right? So, so I only look at at this case here. So when you say begin is zero and end is four, that means I want to find the largest value from index zero to four inclusive, and that's all the value, because since there's five values, the valid indexes are zero, one, two, three, and four, you know, so n minus one. So if I say search from zero to four, um, I, I, I do want nine to be the result. That's the largest one in here, right? Um, so I'll set a breakpoint there and, and step into here. So. Um, so largest recursive um, uses a divide and conquer approach instead of tail recursion. 
So if we launch our debugger again, and we continue from the top, so we hit here and we step into here. We'll step into here. So we're calling, we do, let me do one more step so we can see. So we're calling with begin of zero and end of four. And, and you know, again, look at our call stack here. So we've called largest recursive once, right? I'm gonna set a breakpoint here so I can use that continue trick to um, when we're about to call it to, to see our function call stack, okay? So in this case, um, when begin is in, that's a base case, and we just return. So like if you say find the, the largest from zero to zero, there's only one value in the array that begins and ends at zero, and that's the value to index zero. So you just return that, that's the largest. So that, that ends up being your base case. But here begin is not equal to end, so we're going to call it um, like this, but notice we call it twice, okay? Uh, and if I was to hit continue here, it would it would break um, probably for the first call here. So, so we, we calculate mid, mid was two. So we're, we're gonna try to find the largest from zero to two. So um, uh, I probably can't see the values in here, unfortunately. So one trick on this, um, you could use the debugger to, to actually print out memory, um, but, um, um, uh, but we can, again, step through. So I could go back to, to my call stack, so I should be able to see it easily here. So again, my values, uh, these are the values in the list that we passed in to the largest recursive. So since the midpoint was from zero to two, we're calling one version of largest recursive just on the sub portion of the list from zero to two, and the largest in that should be eight. And then we're calling another one from three to four um, because um, you know, we, we call it from begin to mid, so that'd be from zero to two, and we call it from mid plus one to end, so that'd be you know, two plus one, so that'd be from three to four here, okay? So um, if I can kind of stop my, uh, kind of draw this out here, so basically what happens is you end up with a tree. So, so um, I, won't, I won't draw this as a function call stack. So the first time that you call largest recursive, I'll just call this largest. We have, um, we mostly just need to keep track of begin and end. So initially begin, but I'll call B um, is equal to zero and N is equal to four. Okay, so that, that was how we started off here. Oh, you, you can't see, <laughs> um, that, that, that was how we initially started off. And then on our first call, we, we find a midpoint. Um, so also mid would, would be on here as well. So the midpoint was calculated to be, to be two. So, so again, both global, uh, sorry, both parameters and local variables get pushed on to the function call stack. Because again, if, if I call, if I'm calling this largest um, recursive, um, recursively, I, I would need separate lo me locations of memory allocated to hold the begin and the end and the, um, uh, the midpoint that we just calculated and so on, okay? So, so anyway, when we call it recursively, we, we call it once with um, a begin of zero and then end of the midpoint, so from zero to two. And this is gonna return a result, um, but uh, actually it won't return a result immediately because again, the base case is only when begin and end um, are equal. So this is gonna again calculate the midpoint to be, I should have left room for midpoint. So the midpoint will be zero plus two divided by two, so it'll be uh, one, right? So this will, this will call um, recursively um, from begin equals zero to the midpoint, so end equals one. Right. And even here, we're not done because um, this will finally, though, hit. So, so again, we, if we do zero plus one divided by two, we end up with a half, and that, that's going to get rounded by integer division down to zero. So we'll end up with a midpoint of zero. Okay. So we'll end up calling, run off the end here, so, but we'll end up calling begin of zero and end of zero, and that's going to be our base case. So that returns, I'm looking at my array here on my own code here. So that returns the value of index zero, which is a three. So this is gonna return a three up here, if you can see that. Uh, and then though, after it's returned, it's gonna call it again with the, the begin to be at, at uh, the mid plus one. So it's gonna set begin to be one, and then in to be one, right? And the value at index uh, one is an eight. So it'll return eight, 
That's the largest, or is the value at index one one, okay? And then if you go back and look at the, the code, um, so it basically just takes the max of those two values and returns that as the result, okay? So, um, and, and um, I'll come back to the string here, but, but we're using the max function. So since we return three and eight, um, the max of those two is eight. So, so this will finally return a result of eight up here. All right. then, then we're back to, to here though. Um, so I hadn't finished off kind of uh, doing this tree. So now at this point, we, we called it for begin to the midpoint. And we found that, you know, basically this is saying that the, the largest value from index zero to one is an eight. So I need to find now what the largest value is from index one to two, okay? So this is gonna call again um, with a begin of the midpoint one and an end of two. Um, and that's still not the base case. So we will first call this for begin equals one and end equals one. Notice that, um, um, So I made a mistake here. So there shouldn't have been any um, overlapping work being done. Oh, because, um, yeah, so, so uh, if, if you have to look at the code, uh, in order to avoid that we're doing any redundant work, um, so when I did this here, it actually splits this from zero to two to, to search from zero to one, but then this is just gonna search from two to two. So actually, uh, it didn't do that. So, um, so yeah, the that ends up hitting our base case. Um, so here we just are finding out, looking up the value at index two, um, which is a two, and that will get returned. And then, you know, uh, finally back um, onto this call of the stack, um, it'll do the max between those things, two things are returned. And so again, you know, I'm, you know, make certain you understand what is being calculated here. So what's, what's being said here is that um, so begin was zero and end was two. And it, we found out that the largest value uh, in that range from zero to index zero to index two was an eight. Okay? So that's going to get returned. Eight there, okay. Um, and then I'll just complete this off. So um, this will go to, so since it's, it searched from zero to two first, this will search from begin equals three to end equals four. That's not a base case, so it'll first search from begin equals three to end equals three, um, which um, returns um, uh, the value to index three, which is a nine, and then it will call it for begin equals four to end equals four, which returns the value at index nine, which is a seven. Takes the max of those, which is nine, and return that. And then finally, for our original call, uh, you know, so we, we found that the, the max was eight in, in the array from zero to two, and the max was nine from three to four, so we, we return a final result of nine after doing all that, all right? So yeah, I'm gonna be interested to see how readable that is when on the recorded video here. But so that's an example. And, and and recursion could get even more complex because you know you don't have to split it into two parts. You could split it into split the work into three parts or or arbitrary mini parts, right? So um right. but notice if I was to look at the function call stack, the 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 frames on the stack would have um um, reflected the order that I visited these. So you would have ended up with this on the stack, then, then having these two on the, the function call stack, these three, and then these four, then that would return, going back to three on the function call stack, and we call that, go back to four on the function call stack, that would return, so we're to three, that would return to two, and this would push another one on the stack to calculate that, and so on, right? So let me go back to um, um, the code here. So um, I don't know if it's valuable to, to try and kind of show that, but um, so like here was, I'm still in the very first call frame of calling largest recursive. So if I was to continue on from here, it would be you know going down that left part of the subtrees. Oh, by the way, that tree I just showed was another example of a data structure. So we will be looking at trees as well as stacks. Um, in this class here. So, 
Um, so anyway, if, if we continue on, we're going to be in our call stack um, where it's doing begin is three and end is four. So it actually did it in a different way than I showed by hand here. So it must be going down the right side instead of the left side. So, so when we split it uh, with uh, mid of two, you know, we had to search from zero to two and from three to four. And so we ended up going down the other side first. So, so it must be doing um, the, the last one first, three to four. So from three to four, we're going to search three to three and four to four. So if we continue on to here, we're at the call stack from four to four, and that's going to return the result of the value at index four. Um, so if we step over here, we should see that it's returning the value at list begin, which is at list index four, right? Um, and so on, right? So I'm going to stop kind of stepping over that. So, so anyway, I, 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 you know, I encourage you to, um, try that out, you know, get the debugger working, um, kind of look at, you know, understand the call stack. So one of the purposes of, of a class like this in data structures, where we look at stacks and trees is, is you can understand when you, when you run across these things um, in real operating systems, what's happening and how they're implemented, okay? All right, let's stop the debugger. Um, okay. So then I was kind of expecting maybe some questions about the assignment here, but um, let me just uh, spend maybe five min minutes on it. Um, on our assignment four here. So um, basically you have to implement four functions. Um, the four functions being factorial iterative, factorial recursive, count combinations directly and count combinations recursive, all right? So kind of like I said before, um, I, I suspect that there's not as much work on this one as there was in the last assignment or two, so maybe a little bit less. Um, um, now these need to be regular C++ functions, okay? So don't, you shouldn't be creating a class or anything. Um, and if you're doing that, you would have to actually change the test as I gave them to you, right? So, so you should never change the tests in the unit test file, you just need to uncomment them. But, but the tests, if I can, if I open those up um, for assignment four here. So the first one um, is uh, uncommented here. Uh, you might have to even uncomment the first one because I don't think I gave in any to you initially. But, but yeah, I mean, these are just calling, a, you know, it's not creating a class. It's just calling a function called factorial iterative with zero. Okay. And, and um, so I didn't, I, I guess I assumed that everybody knows what factorial is, right? So, you know, uh, factorial is it's just multiplying things out. So the factorial of zero is by definition one. So, and, and this should be a base case. Um, so you might have one or two possible base cases, um, but you know, factorial of zero should be one, factorial of one should be one, and then anything bigger than that is just the result of doing uh, a multiplication. So 10 factorial, which is often written, um, at, you know, as, as I said in the, um, oops, in the, um, um, we make use of that notation um, in the assignment description. So you use the exclamation mark to indicate that we want to do a factorial. So 10 factorial is just simply um, the result of multiplying 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2, right? And of course, multiplying by 1 is really um, just to show you, but you know, multiplying one by 1 shouldn't do anything. So you really, like, if when you write this, um, as a loop, as you're supposed to for the first one, um, you could do it so that the loop goes from like two to the, the number or from the number down to two to, to get your result here, okay? Oh, but um, yeah, so, but make certain, so it's incorrect if you use recursion for the iterative version. So you need to use iteration, you need to use a loop for factorial iterative, um, but, and it's really though incorrect to use iteration for the recursive version. Okay, so um, the I mean the whole purpose of this assignment is to practice 
um, writing recursive functions, right? So, you know, you'll get a zero for um, rec the recursive versions of these functions if you don't use recursion, right? Even, even if they're working. So if you're doing something that's actually iteration, like a loop or something, um, then you're not doing the assignment um, correct, not completing the, the specification for this function here. Okay? All right, and, and yeah, I haven't had any questions, so I hope it's this is um, clear um, from the description here of what um, the, the um, uh, calculating the number of combinations of in choose i things is. This, this is a, a common useful thing, it's very useful in probability, so if you ever take um, yeah, if you ever take a, a class in basic probability, you'll you'll um, very quickly come to ways to calculate com combinations and permutation permu permutations of things. Um, but this is just the number, right? So if I have four items A, B, C, D, uh, if I want to know the number of combinations of four choose two, I can either have A with B, A with C, or A with D, um, B with C, and or B with D or C with D. And notice that. Um, um, order doesn't matter here. So uh, C with D, D, D with C, where, where you switch those, is not considered a different combination as from, uh, from C with D, okay? So that's the same combination no matter what the order. So anyway, counting combinations is without regard to order. It's just um, uh, which two items from the set of four get picked, no matter what order they get picked out of that set there, okay? So, I mean, you know, as I just did that, you can see that the answer is six, right? Um, so there's a way to count the number of combinations directly of, of you know, so, so in this case, we're choo four items choose two. So that's what the N and the I are here, right? And these become parameters into the function um, that you're writing here. So, so you know, this is the notation for counting combinations, but when you write your function for like count combinations directly here, I'll comment this here so we can see it better. Um, so, you know, we, we choose it, we, we pass in the, the two parameters, but and so you should choose, you should, um, you should uh, read that as, you know, that's the number of items. So that's, you know, this is five choose zero, 10 choose zero, you know, or down here is like uh, uh, choosing from six items. So uh, from six items, choose three. How many combinations are there from six items, choose three, okay? Um, so, keep doing that. So, so again, for the first version of this, to, 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 to count combinations directly, you, you don't need any recursion. You just, well, you just need to reuse your factorial function. And you can use, you can reuse either one. You can use the recursive one or the iterative one, whichever one you like here in this function. Um, but, but all you have to do, you know, so if I have n choose i, I just have to calculate n factorial by calling for example, factorial iterative on n, and I have to call factorial, you have to call your factorial function three times on, on n, on i, and then on n minus i, right? Um, then once you have those three values, you should be able to, to multiply those two um, and, and, and divide that by the result of the n vector. And that, that should be the, the total number of combinations like every time. Notice that, uh, that three choose three or four choose four um, is kind of a base case because if I have four items, there's only one way to choose all four items from a set of four. So that should be kind of obvious of what four choose four is, okay? Um, and it's kind of by definition that if you choose zero items from a set of four, it's considered also, there's only one way to choose no items from any set, no matter how big the set is, right? So there's just one way to choose nothing. You choose nothing. So um, I, I believe I described that here, yeah. So some number choose zero, some number choose in um, is one, and those represent your base case. So when you do this recursively, you need to use this definition for the recursive definition, right? So, so um, these are your base cases. If, if you ever are given um, choose zero, or you're given a set of items of n, and you want to choose um, all n items, um, um, you should check for both of those as separate base cases, and, and you just return one in there result. If not, uh, you want to you're going to split it up into two function calls, recursive function calls. So you want to call uh, your, your recursive function um, count combinations recursively uh, with n minus one, i minus one, and then call it a second time for n minus one and i, and then the sum of the result of those two um, is the answer for n choose i. 
All right. Okay, um, yeah, so um, that's basically it for this help session here. I'm gonna go ahead and end it. Um, as usual, if you have any questions uh, after seeing this or working on the assignment four, go ahead and, and uh, send me an email. Feel free to send your code. Um, um, if, if you're running into an error, you know, try and make certain that you send the compilation error message or the, um, uh, the, the message from your unit test that you're seeing that you're having difficulty with. Um, all right, and um, that's it. Um, and I will see you guys later.